Good morning. Welcome to Tsai Xin Forum. Welcome everyone to this year's Tsai Xin debate live on Davos again. I'm very excited. I'm Li Xing, and the topic today is China investment and economic outlook. Something that almost all economists, um, journalists, um, business community are watching very closely every day. Of course, it's a rather unusual year. The war in Ukraine, the COVID flare up in several Chinese cities, inflation, you name it. But also not to mention, it's a very crucial political year too in China. But in challenging times, you always look for opportunities. And we have a panel very good at that. And from multinational financial institutions, from market experts, from academia, and online virtually from the uh, private sector in China. Let me quickly introduce to you our panelists, and I will start with the quick question for each one of them. For each one of them. So the first gentleman on my left hand side is uh, Mar Marcos uh, Trejo, the president of New Development Bank, formerly Brazil's deputy economic minister and special secretary for foreign trade and international affairs. It has been a fun year, Marcos. So out of the five uh, countries of, of NDB, what's your forecast on the GDP growth this year? Cindy, it's a pleasure to be here and once again uh, uh, join the Akaising discussion. So the New Development Bank was set up by the BRICS countries and uh, we've uh, also uh, embarked on a process of membership expansion. So we have now four new members. We're looking at uh, a GDP expansion in China north of uh, 5%. India is going to grow close to uh, 9%. Brazil is going to grow at around 2%. Uh, South, same for South Africa. Russia is obviously going to have a very severe contraction in its economy out of the new member countries. Bangladesh growing north of 7%. Egypt, 5.5%. Uruguay at around 3%. And the UAE uh, at 4.5%. So if we're talking about economies like uh, uh, China, India, Brazil that feature within the 10 top GDP economies of the world, a robust, still a robust growth for uh, 2022. That's a pretty encouraging message to start with. Um, move on to uh, John Tuttle um, in the middle, uh, Vice Chairman and Chief Commercial Officer of New York Stock Exchange Group. So John, how many Chinese companies are currently listed in NYSE and how many you would see still there within, let's say, two years? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Um, well, I think it's helpful just to pull the lens back for, for, for a moment. So we have 2,400 listed companies on the New York Stock Exchange. About 20% of them are from outside the United States, representing 46 different countries. The country with the most is Canada, natural fit, neighbor to the north. But the country with the second most listings is China. And so, you know, this, the relationship between the New York Stock Exchange and China is about 35 years old and really took off in 1987 when our chairman uh, traveled there and met with Deng Xiaoping. But we have, uh, in the U.S. markets in general, we have about 240 companies from China that are listed in the, on a U.S. exchange. About 82 of those are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. What's interesting, though, is um, from the last time we gathered here in Davos, just over two years ago, we've actually seen that number rise 20%. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a lot of companies from China uh, list in the United States. Going forward over the next two years, um, I'm encouraged those numbers will, will stay where they are, if not grow. That's another very encouraging uh, message to hear. Uh, we watch the number very closely. And um, the next gentleman is Jonathan Crane, uh, CEO of Crane Shares, the first U.S. asset manager 100% focusing on China. And when I visit their website, this says, we believe the relationship between the United States and China will be the most important economic partnership of our lifetimes. How would you describe the current status of this particular important relationship this year, in a few sure. words? Thank you, Lin Shin. It's very, very nice to be here today. And I, I should also add that you know, Crane Shares is a U.S. asset manager based in New York City, and our, we're majority owned by CICC, which is the largest investment bank in China. So we live the U.S.-China relations every day. Uh, so we understand that very well. And I think U.S. and, and China are very codependent. Um, around, um, you know, uh, the, the markets, around trade, around globalization. Uh, our S&P 500 companies in the U.S., uh, their growth is China. 
um, and they're, you know, expanding within China. Uh, China's dependent on U.S. investment coming in into the markets uh, and, and into the country. So there's, there's a, a codependency, but you have the number one and number two economies in the world, and there's going to be a natural tension going forward. Um, and I think uh, from an economic standpoint, business standpoint, there's a lot of interest in, in, in doing business together. I think uh, on the political side, there needs to be more understanding. And I think if these countries, U.S. and China, can... Uh, become closer with better understanding, I think it's better for the world's economy and, and, and peace. Um, so I think this relationship is, is vital going forward. Thank you. And um, the next one is Professor Zhu Ning, Deputy Dean and Professor of Finance, Shanghai Advanced Institute of Finance and uh, at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. I mentioned Shanghai twice. So Professor Zhu, how is the COVID flare up in Shanghai now? <laughs> Well, first of all, I would like to thank Tsai Xin for the invitation again. And I think uh, the life in Shanghai has gradually come back to normal, as evidenced by uh, Marcos and my presence being here. So, I mean, yes, we did make out of uh, the city, and it's not uh, as bad as people are thinking about right now. That being said, I think I mean, the disruption in the uh, consumption scenarios in the supply chain and in people's confidence and expectation is still ongoing. I think it's taking some time before things are fully going back to be uh, fully normal, but I, I'm quite confident about that. Thank you, Professor Zhu. And online, we have Gong Ying Ying uh, joining virtually, the founder, chairwoman, and CEO of EduTech. And they describe themselves as an artificial intelligence and human intelligence driven medical research and services company based in Beijing, listed in Hong Kong. So how are you, Ying Ying? And since you're in Beijing, how many of your colleagues are currently working from home now? Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me and thank you for the question. Uh, Li Xin, we're a tech company. So since 2020, we have uh, adopted a flexible working system that allows people to choose how they want to work. But having that system, you, you really need to have uh, a lot of you know, uh, the project management system, the cell system, meeting rooms online, and uh, and uh, to drive everybody to work efficiently and uh, having them have the flexibility to choose how they want to work. So, uh, so that has been very challenging for me over the past few years. And uh, one thing I do want to share with everybody is that uh, have a, you know, really make my mission very clear, which is making, you know, precision healthcare, uh, accessible to everyone and then we have to keep reminding our, our people and either they're at workplace or at home and uh, and uh, so they know what they're working for and uh, and uh, so you know how you work where you work become less important so now we have employees across 26 provinces and also uh, in four different countries and uh, and uh, it seems that we're working efficiently and very well COVID definitely accelerated digitalization and remote work also in China. So thanks all uh, with the first hand observations and uh, uh, your quick takes from your specific perspective. I want to switch to a, a slightly broader overview. In the last two years, a lot of changes happen. Almost feel like black swan becomes the norm. Something is going to happen. Um, so what are, if you just described overall, what are the key destabilizing factors for Chinese economy that you observed? Let me start with Professor Juning. Uh, right, so I, I think I mean, destabilizing is a word which you sort of use stabilization or stability as the, the, the norm or as the expectation, but then I think things are changing quite dramatically in China, not necessarily in the past few years or as a response to the COVID situation. I think China is undergoing or has been undergoing very fundamental and very important changes in the past five or six years already. I think the, the, the key thing in my view as an economist is we're going from a high speed growth model gradually trying to transition into a high quality growth model. I think this is something that's new not only to China but also to the rest of the world. So let me just quickly elaborate on that. I think in the past we really care about the growth speed. I mean, we always pride ourselves with we have been growing at 8% and faster. But now I think in the past few years, if you read the, the official readout from the government carefully enough, you'll hear more, wor more words about preventing systematic financial risks. You'll hear more words about a common prosperity. You'll hear more words about carbon uh, picking and carbon uh, neutrality. So those are new things which are 
adding more dimensions to China's growth model, which in my view, I think it's not only necessary, but also healthy. Because China has been growing at such a great speed for so long that people have taken it for granted. Well, China should be growing at this fast speed into the future, this linear thinking, this is very human nature. However, we have to keep in mind that China has been facing a lot of challenges by growing this fast, some of that including the, 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 the very high housing prices, which is hurting the, the birth rate. China is now reaching a fairly low birth rate in the past few years. And also China's national level of debt has been increasing, especially after uh, the COVID. So I think there are some challenges which are coming along with the fast or super fast growth model and, and the healthy changes taking place in China. It could be a little bit new or unpredictable to foreign players, to foreign companies, to foreign investors. However, I think if we're looking this from a longer perspective, I think this is giving more quality, more sustainability, more sustainability and more resilience to China's economy. So in that regard, yes, it is different, but I think it is different for a good reason. Thank you, Ning. And I want to uh, hear how uh, Jonathan is observing that trend that Ning just described, the change of gear, the change of growing mo growth model together with some growth pains. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think, um, you know, China experienced with, with the world experience, you know, in a very, you know, being stress tested over the last couple of years with, with COVID. And um, I think they responded very well um, in, at the initial stages um, where a lot of people got back to work. I mean, China, um, I think, was the only country in 2020 to have a positive GDP. Um, and then in 2021, I think the you know, GDP was um, high single digits out of poverty and also for the eco-friendly. I think China is really, I think, prouding, uh, proud of itself in making the commitment which few developing countries have made and the healthy changes taking place in China. It could be a little bit new or unpredictable to foreign players, to foreign companies, to foreign investors. However, I think if we're looking this from a longer perspective, I think this is giving more quality, more sustainability, more sustainability and more resilience to China's economy. So in that regard, yes, it is different, but I think it is different for a good reason. Thank you, Ning. And I want to uh, hear how uh, Jonathan is observing that trend that Ning just described, the change of gear, the change of growing mo growth model together with some growth pains. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think, um, you know, China experienced with, with the world experience, you know, in a very, you know, being stress tested over the last couple of years with, with COVID or looking at that sector for, for an entry point. Is that true, John? Uh, I, I would say there has been an adverse impact on the Chinese economy over the past two years, the, the, picking up a little bit off what Jonathan said. So first of all, uh, because of supply chain disruptions, U.S. and global corporates are looking to diversify their supply chain sources as well. So instead of having that kind of single destination of China, they are now diversifying, which could have an adverse impact. Now, on the capital market side as well, to Jonathan's point, the markets are down. So if you look at from last time we were here and you take uh, kind of an index of Chinese companies listed in the United States, they're down 21 percent right now from where we were two years ago. The S&P is up 21 percent. So there's been this big divergence in the um, in the markets. What I think is very important is making sure that there's clarity around regulation, because that is what global investors want. Many of these kind of uh, great technology companies coming out of China, these exciting companies that are changing the way we work and live, they're going to need to access capital outside of our borders. And so having more certainty around the regulatory landscape and the legal landscape um, will, will better serve investors who are going to be the ones that are allocating companies to fuel even more growth, both domestically in China and globally for these companies. Mm. Thank you. And uh, Marcos, you deal with a lot of FDI investors. Is that the same sentiment? Do you want more clarity on regulation? In reality, I think the big story here is not necessarily what's happening this past two uh, years, but the structural metamorphosis of China's economy. Because it is fair to say that from 1978 up until very recently, China was very much based upon this export-oriented uh, approach that was successful in China and successful in other countries of Southeast Asia, a very high uh, percentage of, of, of savings as a share of, of GDP. So that is, that is changing a lot. So the nature of FDI into China is going to shift as well. Uh, China is no longer a low-cost country. 
China now leads the world in so many areas that are tech intensive. Look at the numbers of, of, of new patents that come out uh, of China going into the uh, or, uh, in, um, uh, intellectual property uh, organization. So this metamorphosis of China towards more value addition, towards a bigger share of GDP going to research, development, and innovation. And the fact now that even China is, is uh, going to other countries for its supply chain when it comes to uh, for example, the most efficient use of the combination between labor and capital will determine the kind of FDI that will go into China. But the numbers are still very robust. I mean, uh, China will keep on being one of the top two destinations for FDI for a long time to come. And even with this change of economic model in China, a lot of opportunities will be generated for boosting supply chains or value chains with different countries of the world. Look, for example, at at the, uh, at the uh, Brazil-China relations. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm from Brazil. Back in 2002, Brazil-China trade was $2 billion a year. Now Brazil-China trade is $20 billion every 100 hours. Mm -hmm. So it's been a dramatic expansion given this structural shift in China's economic growth model. Thank you. So basically the, what's changed is more the reality of the globalization and also the size and the uh, nature of the Chinese yeah, economy. Yeah, I mean, the, the scale makes a lot of difference. For example, if you're talking about a China that's growing 12% of, out of a $2 trillion nominal GDP, the, the contribution that China would advance to, 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 to the formation of global demand was $240 uh, uh, a million. Dollars. Now, if you're talking about an economy that's $15 trillion GDP nominally, and you're growing at 5%, actually your contribution is three times the size when compared to the one of two decades ago. So, so size does matter. China is already the biggest economy of the world when it comes to GDP measure, measure that purchasing power parity terms. We're still a couple of years away for the nominal takeover to, to, to happen in, in terms of China, US. But once again, uh, um, a structural change that will probably keep on China at the forefront of economic growth for the years to come. Thanks, thanks, Marcos. And like Marcos described, size matters. And what making that size of the huge Chinese economy are private sector companies or the uh, state-owned companies, so as a building blocks. Let's turn to Ying Ying, how all those changes we described affecting you and the private sector you observed. Yeah, so I, you know, the market hasn't been friendly to uh, tech companies like us, but I've spent a lot of time asking myself the question, where is the market? And uh, do I have the great, uh, great talents? Do I have a uh, great technology? And are they long-term enough? Do I have enough capital? And, you know, those are the things I can manage and I, I, can, I can make a difference. And I see a lot of uh, digitalization across our healthcare industry over the past two years and it's accelerating across you know public health management research drug development and we see great great technology coming out of that and we see great outcomes as well and i think over the long time it's about the value that you provide for the industry that really set set up the value of the company and uh, and uh, that's how you know i see things and that has that you know i'm still very optimistic over the long term that i think this whole digitalization infrastructure will provide a lot of opportunities for many many companies like myself and uh, and it will also provide great technology you know for the entire world thank you thank you ying ying and come back a little bit, uh, zoom out on the bigger trends. I want to ask Professor Juning, people still have a lot to worry on Chinese economy this year. COVID, we just mentioned, is one of them. And then the slow consumption, and then the, uh, um, whether export can be as strong as the previous two years when the rest of the world are coming back on the supply chain. So do you think there are still enough tools in the uh, regulator's toolbox to tackle all these challenges and continue boosting the economy? Well, I think the short answer is yes. And I want to follow up on Marco's earlier comments about, I mean, even in the past couple of few years, I think China's contribution to the global GDP growth is over 25% a quarter. So that's bigger than most of the time, bigger than the com combined contribution from India and the US, uh, typically the number two and number three uh, global economy uh, powerhouses. So I think that's still saying the, the, the power, the dynamism in China's economy. And China has been known for having a large and active government, and the government has been very pro-business, pro-growth in the past. So even though I think there's some short-term headwind or short-term fluctuation, I think let's not forget, Chinese government has not tapped 
any of the non-traditional fiscal or monetary policies yet, unlike many of the Western governments. So uh, we have been reducing rent, reducing taxes for small and medium enterprises, but we have not reached the point of giving out money yet. But that is an option. And some local governments in China have already started experimenting with giving out consumption coupons, which have been uh, proved to be useful in helping economic and in household consumption. So I think that is quite important. And on the monetary side, uh, unlike most of the central banks, which reduce the interest rate to close to zero uh, threshold, I think China's interest rate has been remaining in the more, more normal to 2.5% of the range. So that means that China is still having a lot of room, if it wants to, to lower interest rate to give monetary stimulus to the economy. So I think in that regard, I think we have a lot of uh, uh, tools in the two boxes for now. But with that said, I think I do want to follow up. Again, I think size is really important. So compared to 2008, right after the global financial crisis, China's economy is more than three times, close to four times as big right now as it was some 14, 15 years ago. So even the same amount of stimulus from the government will not have the same marginal impact on the growth. So we have to be realistic with, even if we could have another four trillion stimulus packages, which I am not so sure, but many people are making this analogy. Even if we are going to have that kind of stimulus, we're not going to have the same kind of impact on the economic growth as we saw in 2009 and 2010. Hmm. It's very interesting. And then thanks for sharing a, a very important macro overview. And then the headwinds that you mentioned, one of the headwinds that people pay a lot of attention to, like John mentioned, is basically tightening on the tech sector. So Jonathan, you've been observing the Chinese market for a long time. Sure. How do you think the tightening on the tech sector is affecting the global investors' perception of the China market? And also, like you said, is now the buying time now? <laughs> is that over? Is the, is the visibility of a regulation in sight? Yeah, so I think, I think it's important to set a, set a context when, when talking about the tightening. You know, I, I actually don't call it tightening, but the, you know, the regulations that come on the Internet sector. So first of all, the China Internet technology sector is 40 percent of China's GDP. OK, you have 1.4 billion consumers, 700 million middle class now consuming through these uh, Internet technology names. I mean, we all know of Alibaba. Badu, um, you know, Tencent, and uh, but there's there's a whole uh, there's a whole uh, uh, group of you know smaller companies now innovative coming up. So the sector is going to grow, but also the consumer is growing. Okay, so you know, China, you know, in this this whole sector has grown a lot tremendously in the last uh, ten years. So I think the I don't look at it so much as the tightening of of this sector. I think it's more providing uh, regulations that really are around, you know, anti-monopoly, antitrust, cybersecurity, regulations that came in that really are going to set up this sector for long-term stronger growth. Um, and I think that's how uh, the Chinese government was looking at it. And it's only natural. We, we do that in the United States. Europe's doing it. So instead of this being uh, negative, and yes, it w there was downward pressure on the markets, uh, um, you know, I'll give you an example. A lot in the educational technology. Education is very important in China, and a lot of money was being spent by consumers in education uh, technology. Some of these regulations were actually celebrated by consumers in China. It made it uh, much more affordable, even though the markets put downward pressure on, on some of these companies. So I think long term, um, you know, th this is w was healthy. Um, it has created... Um, uh, an interesting uh, entry point. We talked about it before, um, where where you know the these valuations have come way down. Um, but you know we 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 also see um, uh, you know the in re, the in the the same thing that uh, put downward pressure um, on the sector is actually uh, the same driver that's going to put the sector back on track, and that's government uh, regulations and policy, basically. So. You've heard in the last couple of months, uh, you know, President Xi and uh, Premier Li and Vice Premier Liu He uh, all come out and say that they're supporting this internet technology sector. Um, there'll be stimulus, um, and so I think the regulations were were meant to be healthy long term, um, and then now you're seeing um, 
Uh, all the high-level officials uh, talk about how they're supporting the sector. Look, it's 40 percent of GDP. It's a big part of, um, of, of China's future, and it's, uh, you know, it's how this 1.4 billion consumers um, interact every day. That's their daily lives is through these, uh, through these companies. Thank you. So it's a regulation more of a catch-up and uh, long-term oriented. Ning, you have something to add? Yes, I just want to quickly follow up on uh, what Jonathan said about, I think many of the policy changes to China's platform companies or internet companies are not that different with what has been happening to the giant tech companies in the West. If you think about the differentiated pricing, if you think about the barriers to innovation, if you think about the labor conditions, I think it's largely in line with, it's not just about China, it's more of a global phenomenon about how we uh, tackle the giant tech companies, which is a new phenomenon in the global economy. So in that regard, I think China is not different, but actually try quite, quite a joining force with the global practice in trying to find the better approach to regulate and to uh, foster the growth of such companies. Thank you. So it's part of the global trend. While, you, while we have you name, another hot button issue I want to, uh, to comment on is people watch about the real estate sector very closely in China. And that is described as a tightening. But we see signs of loosening in a couple of Chinese provinces and cities around and computer loosen up a little bit. So what, what, what will be the next outlook of the real estate sector? <laughs> Yeah, I'm probably regarded as one of the, the, the big critic of China's housing prices and all the housing sector. I think the, the curbing policy on the housing sector is relaxing. I think in two different areas. For the supply side, for the real estate developers, I think the financing to the real estate developers are being relaxed. So I think for those uh, developers which have been uh, uh, cash stranded, I think now they're receiving some of the much needed uh, cash flow support from the banks, from the bond issuance, and from some of the foreign market. And also, I think on a different city level, the curbing policy, the qualification for buying, selling, and getting a finance to buy an apartment has been gradually relaxed. So in that regard, I think the policy has been more relaxed right now compared to six months ago. And that, that being said, I think there's still two things we have to be very uh, realistic about. One is, I think China's housing price to income ratio, price to uh, rent ratio is still quite out of whack compared to the international standard. So whether that is going to gradually converge to the international norm or that is going to remain that high, I think that remains to be seen. So I think that's a bigger fundamental information we have to think about. The second is, I think, about expectation. I think expectation has been the one thing which the, the Central Economic Working Conference emphasized on last December. So with the housing prices so high, do people still have the belief that a housing price will keep rising in many cities of the country? I think that will be a very key factor determining or influencing China's, China's willingness to buy another apartment going forward. Mm, thank you. So price is too high and the expectation is to be managed. And um, I want to switch on to another bright spot or uh, the uh, very uh, hot button spot, um, decarbonization. So there have been a massive campaign on decarbonization. The pressure comes not from the government, but also from a lot of international investors as well. So from that angle, Zhang, I want to ask you what Chinese companies should know about the rising standard from the global investors on ESG and decarbonization? Sure. And, and if I could just take yeah. a step back for one moment, just to follow up on a comment that that Jonathan made around the regulation that's taking place in China right now. I think embedded in that is an assumption by everybody that you know, the Chinese government is obviously acting in the best interest near, medium, and long term of the population with regard to the regulation. I, what, what is impacting the market, though, and the sentiment of international investors is the communication of those strategies. And so having the, uh, you know, what would be viewed by global investors as, as very short timelines or not surprises and things like uh, changing regulation in, in education, in uh, ride sharing, in cyber. Uh, I'm sorry, in technology companies from the Cybersecurity Review Board. Now, another way you're going to attract a lot of international uh, investors is having a focus on ESG. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of studies out there, but the most recent one I, I saw was 40% of institutional capital deployed over the past 12 months was tied to some sort of ESG mandate. Now, that can vary how intense the ESG mandate is from kind of a basic screening to in-depth analyses done by, um, done by 
institutional investors. But to continue to attract foreign direct investment into China, into the Chinese markets, uh, we strongly encourage our Chinese issuers and those companies that are thinking about tapping the international capital markets to have a good grasp on ESG and be reporting statistics around their, their, their climate footprint, their decarbonization path, their, their sustainability programs as well, because that will, again, attract those global institutional investors. And that could be everything from your large global asset managers like the Black Rocks of the world to the, um, to the pension funds to even smaller asset managers whose LPs, their limited partners' capital, may be tied to, to that fund having some sort of ESG mandate. So we're in constant dialogue uh, with companies from China and from around the world to make sure that they're able to tell their story with the right metrics and in the right way to the global investor base to help attract more focus. Because it, it, you know, if we were here two years ago, that number was below 40%. It's at 40% now, and it's only going to continue to climb. Yeah, thank you. And Marcos, from your standpoint, how do you see the uh, change of awareness and capacity on ESG in China on the ground? I see China at the forefront growth at the, uh, at the uh, discussion of, of ESG practices, but also in terms of policy implementation. Uh, what I think China uh, wants, and, and I think this is true about other emerging markets as well, is some of the ESG standards or rules should be multilateral defined. It should not be a top-down approach from some countries to others, so it's something that is collectively uh, built. But uh, I mean, this, this uh, attachment of China to uh, promoting best practices in ESG is on one of the reasons why for the first five years, our institutions was able to direct 25% of everything with finance to uh, climate-oriented uh, 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 projects. And in this next cycle of five years, we've just uh, adopted the new strategy. We're going over to up to 40%. So whether you're talking about uh, wind energy, energy transition, solar panels, a number of uh, um, uh, ESG-friendly technologies, uh, China's at the forefront as well. One of the most important contributions we get to how we define the new development go bank going forward is a result of China's uh, uh, positive influence in ESG practices. Almost doubled in a five-year plan from 25% right. to, to 40%. 40%. Yeah. Yeah. And Yingying, let me turn to you. Um, one trend people watch China very closely is the looming demographic challenges. And um, that made healthcare a really hot sector as well. So can, can tech provide solutions to China's demographic and aging problem? Uh, for sure. You know, that's the, the thesis of our company. And, uh, you know, our solution is already being used by, you know, hundreds of clients around the world. And, you know, for patient management, drug developments, and uh, clinical services, and so on and so forth. I can just give you a, a specific example. They say a drug is a billion dollars in 10 years. Recently, we just shortened a rare diseases drug phase two trial by 20 months, just, you know, using our disease knowledge graph for better trial design, better you know, clinical trial execution, and the more intelligent patient enrollment. And that dollar value finally trans trans transferred to the final patients. So you know, using is already very viable, and we have a lot of great outcomes for public health management, drug, uh, uh, drug development. So yes, for sure. Thank you. So um, we talk a lot about what's going on inside China from sectors, from the economy, this and that. But there's a lot happening outside China as well. What are the global trends that are affecting Chinese economy from externally? So um, inflation, food crisis, supply chain, just like uh, our previous panelists mentioned, supply chain onshoring or nearshoring, or somebody called that French shoring. So Marcos, how would you see the external factors impacting China? So I think that the rerouting of global value chains is absolutely one of those trends. I'd rather use the expression value chains than supply chains because this goes much beyond the issue of supply. Uh, it means uh, that new marketing centers, new research and development centers are being set up around the world, which will create new uh, areas of attachment and, and, and cooperation. And I think here, um, in this particular regard, we will see a lot of decoupling but we will see a lot of neo-coupling as well, connections that were not there before and that are uh, made possible both for China's uh, economic scale, but also because of China's economic sophistication. Once again, China's investment, for example, in research and development is 
uh, reaching close to a level that's observed in OECD uh, countries. Um, so uh, once again, this value addition that you see in, 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 uh, in global chains uh, as far as China is concerned will be one of the most important magnets in attracting uh, new investments to China and creating opportunities across the emerging market world. Thank you. So decoupling and neocoupling. Neocoupling, yeah. Neo -coupling so, yeah so some of the time. sectors that have been sort of uh, bonded together over the past few decades will definitely uh, divorce. They will separate. This is also natural because of the evolution of the economies of the sectors. But other connections that were simply not there will be made possible because of China's economic evolution. Right. And um, what are the global investors' perspective on that moving on in the near and long term, Jonathan? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, global investors are, are, you know, are interested in China, but have to be interested in China. It's the second largest economy in the world, second largest equity market, second largest bond market. Um, and it's, it's ju just getting included in global indexes. So everyone, you know, or, you know, a few years ago, MSCI included China, the second largest equity market in the world for the first time in global indexes. So if you look at the benchmarks, MSCI world, China's second largest economy is only 4% of that index. The United States is 60%. So, you know, a lot of the global investors don't even, you know, don't have a lot of exposure to China, but that has to change as uh, the indexes increase China's, uh, you know, inclusion going forward. Um, so we see, um, uh, you know, significant flows, asset flows going into the A-share market uh, as global investors have to rebalance uh, uh, these indexes. That's hundreds of billions of dollars going into the A-share market. We also see inside China um, institutions buying uh, their equity markets, okay? That's going to start increasing. And then the, as the, it's the fastest growing wealth management and asset management market in the world, you're also, you know, starting to see um, financial planning come on board, um, 401k type of plans uh, starting. And so you're going to see also the consumer um, starting to, you know, do buy and hold investing into the, into the mainland market. So, um, you know, right now the mainland market is maybe 4 or 5% owned by international investors. That will change. Um, so, you know, we see uh, significant interest in, in China, uh, but also, you know, uh, investors having to uh, allocate going forward as these benchmarks grow. Then we also see key themes uh, coming out of China. I mean, urbanization um, is a really interesting theme that sets off a lot of investment opportunities. Um, you, know, the, you know, just an example, China's right now at 60 percent urbanization will be going about 85 percent. Hundreds of millions of people moving to city cities. The United States was 60 percent urban right after World War II. And then we, you know, our whole middle class grew. The American dream happened. And that's where we see China just beginning. And it, and it creates uh, very interesting um, thematic type of investing in Internet technology, health care, um, you know, 5G, um, and then uh, all around uh, the environment and clean tech. I mean, China will, you know, ha will become a leader around that, too. So um, the consumer China, we think... Uh, the world, um, global investors are, are really trying to figure out how to get that exposure. Um, and so, you know, we're, you know, there's, there's a positive outlook even amongst, um, you know, the, these, you know, sort of, uh, you know, challenges around the downward pressure of the markets. I think you'll see increased um, allocations to China by global investors. Thank you for putting that in the uh, longer horizon. Economies have swings and cycles, or no, and um, in the challenges we just mentioned, and um, there are also opportunities arising. So we, behind that, what we see is, what we need to find out is the resilience of the economy that we can pinch our hope on. Um, what do you see as the resilience of Chinese economy, John? A lot of things, but I would say chief among them is 1.4 billion. 1.4 billion people, one, hundreds of millions of entrepreneurs, 1.4 billion consumers, 1.4 potential invest, 1.4 billion potential investors. I mean, the, to, to Jonathan's point, the, the market has just barely been scratched. And there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. Despite regulatory headwinds on both sides of the Pacific, in the United States, in Beijing, you know, the longer term, investors seek opportunity. And at 1.4 billion people, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. Size matters. It does. <laughs> And uh, Ning, what do you see from the Chinese perspective? What do you see as a resilience? 
Well, I, I think probably two things. One, I mean, following up on John's comment about is the people. I think people who are willing to work very hard, people who are aspiring for better uh, quality of life, and people who are very flexible, resilient, resilient and uh, uh, willing to uh, go through a lot of uh, challenges. And then I think there's the government. I think Chinese government is also known to be very pro-growth, proactive. And then in that regard, I think uh, we're, we have been going through like the the 98 global financial, uh, the Southeast Asia global uh, financial crisis, the 2008 global financial crisis, we have been going through some of the headwinds, maybe not as uh, uh, much right now because, I mean, the, the, the average growth speed is slower right now. But I think the government has been known for being very pragmatic, being very nimble, being very uh, adaptive to uh, deal with the, the, the changing environment. Yeah, May I jump in? Yeah. Size matters but your approach to globalization matters as well. Even if you have 1.4, 1.5 billion people and all of a sudden you close yourself to the rest of the world, your economic performance is gonna be hurt. That's not what we see in China. Last year, for example, I remember President Xi Jinping arguing that China would, for the next decade, import $25 trillion. That's openness to a globalization. Welcome, welcoming FDI at the levels of, uh, that China is welcoming right now and setting up those partnerships. That's openness to globalization. So if, if you have one of the key players in the global economy uh, steady in the course and being open to globalization, I think this is a very uh, positive message to be sent out. Thank you. So size matters, but plus the right attitude, which is openness. To globalization. To globalization, yeah. yes. And um, that's wonderful discussion, really insightful. I enjoyed it a lot. But before wrapping up, I want to give each of our panelists a scenario. If you are invited to give one piece of advice to a specific person, how, what, what would you say? I'll start with Marcos. A multinational company wants to expand to China, but have worries in mind, including even a remote potential of sanctions and the supply chain uh, disruptions we just mentioned. What would you say? Well, I, I think uh, the level of openness uh, in China will continue to be steady or, or, or go up. And I think one should have in mind two things. Yes, scale will continue to be extremely relevant, but the sophistication, and this is something our colleagues here of the PANU have alluded to, the sophistication of, of, the, uh, of the Chinese domestic market is going to be a constant over the next couple of years. More and more value addition, more and more sophisticated industrial and financial products will be the way to go when you are uh, thinking about China. Yeah, skill and sophistication. And then move on to John. Um, let's say, you, I'm sure you asked that many times. If a US investor come to you and what should look for the next opportunity in China, what do you think he should bear in mind, he or she should bear in mind? Well, I think it's, it's the same thing I would tell the investor whether they're investing in China, the United States, or anywhere in the world. Look at the fundamentals. Look at the look at the fundamentals of the company, the management team, the strategy. But also look at the regulatory landscape as well, and make sure you have done your diligence before allocating capital that you've been a uh, that you've been entrusted to help grow. So fundamentals and your own due diligence. And uh, Jonathan and um, you, we talk about tech a lot. Now, a lot of Chinese tech companies are going abroad. So what would, advise, what would you advise a Chinese tech company owner looking to building a global footprint? Sure, I think it's important uh, to localize teams. So whatever country you come into, have, have local teams with local leadership there um, that fits in well and, and can communicate well uh, you know, on the ground to build the operation. I also think, um, you know, China offers, the, the world's very interested in that we keep talking about this 1.4 billion consumer. So I think what you can also offer partners around the world is a, be a bridge, a trusted bridge back into China also. Um, so I think focus on uh, bringing something, um, you know, uh, to, to the table, which is really acting as that bridge um, that, that, can, that can help partners get, it, get entry points into the China market. And then I'd also say, um, trust is very important. I mean, you have to, uh, to get trust, you got to give trust. So I think, um, you know, there, there's got to be uh, a, a focus on that. So bridge and trust. Yep. And Professor Juning, there are 11 million Chinese graduates hitting the job market this year and largest in history. Some of them are your students. So what's, what would be your piece of advice to a young Chinese graduate looking for a job? Well, I, I think they should listen to this panel about the, uh, the exchange of ideas. And I think they should, uh, 
uh, hopefully, I think that, that they should remain, I mean, as we discussed in this session, remain positive for the longer term and be prepared for the shorter term. Be prepared and remain positive. Uh, Ying Ying, you have the last word. Um, what would you say to a young Chinese woman just like you wants to start her own company? So uh, I'm a mother of three, and uh, my kids need a lot of my time, and I feel very lucky with two things. One is uh, you really need great partners and a great team, you know, that you can rely on because there are times that uh, you know you're just not available, and uh, and secondly that uh, you need to find something that uh, you know you feel your kids in the future generation can also benefit. So that keeps the passion going, and uh, I'm very motivated to eliminate as many diseases as possible with our technology. Thank you, thank you, Ying Ying. And with that little personal touch, we have to wrap up our discussion today. Thank you very much for participating. And this is a special year. One thing we need to mention is we commemorated the fifth anniversary of the Nixon visit to China. It's worth remembering that, that the collaborative advantage we had and we can unleash moving forward. Thank you for joining this year's Taishin debate, and I'll see you next year. Thank you.